This presentation is a snapshot of an ongoing research project that takes as its subject an annual 48-hour film challenge in Portsmouth on the south coast of the UK. Oh, hello. As you are already aware, the robots have taken over and our old way of life, seen here, is now gone. You understand what you're programmed to understand. We must learn to coexist, hand in claw, with our robot overlords. Or, of course, be crushed. The challenge has been running for 16 years, having started in 2006. Run by an enthusiastic group of local volunteers, the challenge has generated over 300 short films and over 1,500 filmmakers, cast and crew, have taken part. Initial findings are based on data informally gathered by the organisers over an extended period of time. For example, BBC producer Ben Sutton, a challenge participant 2007 to 2015, has on a number of occasions related his own personal story of how he took part for the first time aged 14. He then participated yearly through school, college and then university where he set up his own 48-hour film challenge. As a filmmaker, I think it's really good practice and I learn a lot each time I take part. The community is great and it's a very nice celebration of filmmaking. DV Mission is like the best film school in the world. It has taught me so much about the practice of filmmaking and has contributed a lot to my knowledge. The experience I have gained has secured me work professionally and I consider DV Mission to have directly contributed to that success. So what is a 48-hour film challenge? You might think of a 48-hour film challenge as a kind of filmmaking hackathon, a time-delineated, intensive, team-orientated, rapid prototyping activity. The heritage of the 48-hour film challenge lies early on in the amateur Super 8 filmmaking of the 1960s and 70s and the later accessibility of affordable video technologies such as VHS, SVHS, Hi8 and Mini DV digital video. Its roots further lie in the 24-hour play and the 24-hour comic movements in the USA. Its emergence also links to a growth in low and micro-budget short filmmaking in the 1980s and the development of underground screenings such as Exploding Cinema, which emerged from the London squatting scene in 1992. The first documented 48-hour film challenge was staged in Washington DC in 2001 by Mark Ruppert and Liz Langston. Their 48-hour film project was franchised in 2011 and is now an international challenge that occurs annually in over 100 cities worldwide. The idea for the first UK 48-hour film challenge originally came from DIY filmmaker Johnny Oddball. In 2002, he issued a provocation to UK filmmakers. On Friday, pick a title and a theme out of a film can and use them to make a film within 48 hours. Then return two weeks later to watch your film on the big screen. Limited time filmmaking can also be thought of as a sport in which participants are engaged in a race to the finish. In fact, these kinds of linguistic cues are typically used when describing a 48-hour film challenge. The use of the term start line, finish line, awards night, the imposition of rules, the need for resilience, the notion that the challenge is one of endurance as well as performance, all contribute to the sense that the 48-hour film challenge is akin to a sporting event. Another unifying trait of the 48-hour film challenge is the use of constraints or obstructions as a means of promoting creativity. These will typically be a combination of factors which the filmmakers must either include or respond to, e.g. a genre, a title, line of dialogue, props, actions, locations and so on. You might also think of the 48-hour film challenge as a ritual celebration in which the forging of social ties is balanced with skills development through experiential learning. Motivation is a core theme in the literature on 48-hour film challenges and there is a strong sense that it is often the informal, playful nature of the event that attracts filmmakers to participate. Mercer and Wilson note that participants will often cite the taking part as the most important part of the event. So how do we theorise the 48-hour film challenge? When asked by other filmmakers as to why he was doing these events and if he was doing them to get into the film industry, Johnny Oddball replied, 
No, I've created my own film industry out of new talented filmmakers from all over the UK. This is mirrored in the experience of DV Mission, which appears in microcosm to have generated its own film industry from a diffuse and disparate community of creatives located by and large in the Solent region of the UK. Three themes have emerged so far from the research. The first speaks to the geographical and economic relationship of DV Mission as a peripheral practice, shadow site and micro cinema. The second develops the idea that DV Mission is a special case of a network of practice. Finally, there is an important sense that the 48 hour film challenge is a lived experience. How can we restore honour to the dragon's shadow? That's not the way to win. Is there a way to win? Micro cinema can be thought of as small scale, do it yourself, low to no budget guerrilla filmmaking that is typified by a persistent transience. Often positioned in antithesis to the mainstream or more formal forms of production and exhibition, sometimes taking a critical, politicised position, while in other instances merely positing an alternative space for operation and dissemination. It often takes an oppositional position in relation to dominant ideologies. Distribution is largely via small local screenings via YouTube and other open platforms, and audiences often limited to the filmmakers themselves, other creative media makers and or those with an interest in counterculture. A microcinema is a peripheral space. It's a site where media makers gather to engage in production activities that are neither central to the mainstream or to small cinema. A site of practice which echoes the formal economy yet simultaneously exists outside of formal regulation of modes of production and exchange, a shadow site. Studies in economic anthropology have shown, however, how informal economies or shadow economies cannot be disentangled from those that dominate. Although it may not appear that DV Mission is part of the mainstream or even a small cinema, the point here is that it is entangled with the core. Portsmouth is sandwiched between two areas of high concentration and growth and many of the participants come from these areas to the east, west and north of the city. Consequently, DV Mission, though not part of the core, is at the same time directly engaged with it and, it is argued, this brings value to the city, its creative economy and the creative talent who live here. That's not the way to win. I'm winning this time. It's not a community of practice, but a network of practice. Why is this important? Well, it's useful to be able to define our terms in order to understand exactly how this relationship between the core and periphery operates. So it is helpful if we begin by differentiating these two key terms in order to properly identify a sense of social practices. So if a community is typified by a shared identity that emerges from a set of collective intentions that aim to harness and curate particular domains of knowledge, then in contrast, a network can be typified as a set of personal relations motivated more by self-interest than by a desire to steward a domain of knowledge or a set of professional practices. This diagram goes some way towards clarifying the difference. So a network is often static, linear, connected, transactional, whereas a community is more fluid, non-linear, and the emotional and relationships are more important. The film industry, is argued here, overlaps both domains. So it is not a community of practice, nor is it a network of practice. In the case of the film industry, it's primarily organised through the undertaking of projects coordinated through project networks. Production companies, network organisations led by producers, network coordinators, enact network-based control in order to implement projects. Thus the industry is decentralised, and the project network is the primary form of relations between project actors and the project is the primary organising mechanism. This network diagram represents what this might look like in the case of the film industry. As you can see, it includes characteristics of a community of practice, a project network 
and a network of practice. It is argued that with a film production, social actors are formally employed with hierarchies, contractual obligations and mandated rules, but organised via project networks on a project-by-project -project basis and typified by precarity of employment. In the core, participants are formally designated and assigned, while in the periphery, participants are just as likely to be volunteers without formal restrictions based on membership. Members are decentered, dispersed, and though they interact with each other face-to-face -face in order to complete work tasks, social relations are characterised as both strong and weak. Participation is both jointly and individually determined and requires a regular reconfiguration of new and unique teams in order to achieve work goals. The 48 hour film challenge is also a lived experience. An important consideration when investigating impact is to consider the social and cultural aspects, not just the economic. Following Bourdieu, participants in a 48 hour film challenge can be thought of as agents who carry cultural capital with them into a site of practice, where it is recirculated through collective experience out of which the formation of a shared identity membership of group or communities emerges. The shared experience generates new cultural capital. The return to place by returning a year later to the same challenge further embeds membership within personal habitats. Importantly, barriers to entry to this community are very low. Typically, only a willingness to take part and get involved acts as an obstruction. Place is something to return to, which is at once familiar, brimming with recollections. It gathers histories, things, ideas, structures, bodies, experiences, feelings and holds them in a complex configurations of thoughts and memories. In this way, the experience of participating is manifest in the film, not just as a cultural artefact in isolation, i.e. the film, but as signifier of a semiotic relationship with a place which coalesces through the experience of becoming an emergent property of social relationship. What is clear is that deep emission is very good at helping new entrants get a foot in the door. A key issue for a network of practice of this kind is the way in which new entrants are trained and how they are socialised. Barriers to entry into the film industry are typically elevated and it is highly competitive. There are no simple steps to take and the main factor that enables success is your ability to network and form relations with those already working in the sector. As a research respondent in a study into film industry careers says, you have to find people who like to make movies. This is where an event like DV Mission can play its part in relation to the core. Even though it is in effect a peripheral shadow site, it can still function as a point of entry for novices and new entrants. The common understanding of conventions, routines, terminologies, hierarchies and etiquette among a diverse, varied and dispersed group of people is what enables an individual to arrive on set to meet a group of people with whom they have never worked before and know exactly how to fit in. It is through participation in peripheral projects that new entrants can gain this kind of know-how. Typically, this can be achieved by participating in the production of no to low budget filmmaking, internships, work placements, helping out on set or participating in a 48 hour film challenge. Participation in these kinds of activities assists with the acculturation process. It helps identify gatekeepers, assists with the development of interpersonal skills, promotes the assimilation of industry norms and values, establishes reputation as someone people want to work with, expands skills in relations to competence and capabilities, demonstrates motivation and persistence. Most importantly, it enables social actors to develop an identity as a filmmaker and to develop a habitus that is recognisably that of a member of a network of practice, in this case, that of a filmmaker. Top tip for anyone doing DB Mission, I'd say, uh, don't take it too seriously. The top tip is that it's not about winning, it is about making it, it's about doing it, it's about doing the process. The biggest piece of advice I would give people is make decisions quickly and go with them. 
This is the greatest weekend of the year as far as I'm concerned. You know, I personally get a huge amount of enjoyment out of this. And really, really enjoyed the whole idea of a 48-hour film competition. I hadn't really heard of anything like that. I thought it was brilliant. And so the next year it came round, I decided to enter my own team and, and do it for myself. So, yeah. For filmmakers, I think it just teaches them to be resourceful. Um, we've shot some films on like, iPhones, on stupid little compact cameras, on DSRs. We've edited on just about everything possible. One of the common challenges to face is always getting the edit to at least two minutes. You always find you overshoot because you panic and then you sit down and you try and work it all out and it's just way too much footage. And, and yeah, just three o'clock in the morning, like trying to pack all that stuff down and then move over into editing. And for me as a corporate filmmaker, it's really nice to actually just spend the weekend having fun making silly films that we wouldn't otherwise get to make. And I've been doing a DV mission for nine years now. Uh, more than a third of my life has been taken up on DV Mission. The biggest challenge of doing DV Mission is probably li literally having no idea what you're going to be doing um, and trying to plan but not being able to plan anything until 5 o'clock on Friday um, and then spending 12 hours crying trying to write a script. Everyone's brilliant. There's so, there's so many teams here that just make absolutely fantastic films and you, you know, it's, it's all friendly, it's all fun but you know, you want to beat them, you, want to, you, want, you, know, you still want to beat the guys that you saw last year who made that really good film and you were like, oh that film was brilliant, I still remember it, I'm going to make a film that was better than that one last year. So everyone's benchmarking each other as it were. Right back at the beginning, uh, I always wanted to enter one and in the end it seemed that to run one was the only way I was going to get, get a chance to take part in one. So that was my initial motivation. Um, and then the second year, it's like, well, let's do it anyway. By the third year, people were saying, when is it on? By the fourth year, people were demanding it was on, and so it's just kept going ever since.